Welcome to the road to growth, success of an entrepreneur. We've raised the bar. Learn firsthand from successful business owners and create your own path to success. I'm going to show you how great I am. It's time to hit the road to growth with team lead of the Enriquez Group, Realtor Vinny. All right, so we are here with Mike Cameron. We were talking before we got on to, uh, to the mic. So on your website, you have entrepreneur, author, speaker, human being. That got me off guard when I looked at it. So tell me what, tell everyone listening what you do. Yeah, well, I mean, professionally, I'm a speaker. You know, the, the, the question is, is what you do who you are? And that was why I, uh, I sort of switched up that human being title. It was, I don't know, probably six or seven years ago, I ran into a guy that talked a lot about the roles that we play. And I actually, I don't know if I have any right here. I don't think I do. Um, but my business card, actually my title on my business card is human being. And it, it gets people talking as, you know, obviously it caught your attention. Uh, and the reason I put that is because I think sometimes we get so caught up in these roles that we have. You know, I'm a, a businessman. I'm a sales guy. I'm a realtor. I'm a mortgage broker. I'm a whatever. I'm a father. But, you know, at the end of the day, I'm just a friggin' human being. And if we focus on just being better human beings, I think we become better at all those different roles that we play. So well, it's interesting. It's interesting you say that we're, are we defined by what we do or, or not? And it's, it's one of those things when I lived in Prague when I was younger, mm. I, think I might've said this on a past episode, but I lived in Prague and it was funny cause I, I knew people, but we never really talked about what they did for a living. We didn't know what age they were. It was, they were defined by who they were. And it seems like one of the first questions you get here when you're at the bar or wherever it is, what do you do for a living? Who are you kind of thing? Right. Yeah. yeah that's interesting. So a, a cultural thing, that's really interesting. I'd love to explore that a little more. I, I know certainly, you know, as we get into my story and I'll, I'll share uh, a, a little bit more, but you know, there was definitely a time in my life where, where I switched it up completely. And when somebody would ask me what I did, um, I had this whole list of things that I would rattle off as opposed to saying, you know, I run a business or whatever. Uh, I would I would rattle off all the different things that encompassed who I was and it completely caught people off guard. And they kind of like, oh, that was probably more information that I needed to know. But OK, thank you. And I just because I got kind of tired of of the. Um, Again, the the this is what I do for a living. It's not who I am, and it's not exclusively what I do. Well, and I think in our in our community sometimes, and when I say community, our bubbles, right? We're trained to say certain words just because we're supposed to, we're supposed to say those words. Like, how are you doing? And sometimes you're just saying it because you really don't care. But you, they said how you're doing or what what's going on. You're just trained to say these words. Yeah. And so when you give a, a sense of of reality to the other person. Like, well, you know what. This was this was a cordial. How are you doing? This wasn't actually. I really didn't care how you're doing. So. Well, it, it's funny because I do sometimes ask that. Like I can be quite playful. So depending on the circumstance, when when somebody asks me that, I will often ask, like, "Do you really want to know, or, or do you just want me to say I'm good?" Because because I'm happy to go either way. Like if you just want me to say I'm good and and on we go with our conversation, that's fine. But if you really want to know. I'm happy to dive into it. I had a really shitty day today. I'm struggling with whatever, you know, again, because you're right. Quite often, we 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 don't necessarily actually want to know how you're doing. We're just doing the formalities. So, I mean, we talked before we started doing this, and I know one of the, the, the big core things that you talk about in a lot of your speaking engagements is about basically the murder that happened to your uh, ex-girlfriend. And if you can, maybe we'll get to that. But can you kind of tell us who you are first and then kind of walk us to that point? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, like I said, I, I, uh, I've been a business guy for 20 some odd years. Um, I started my career. I kind of joke. I, I, I started my career literally bagging shit for a living. When I was 18 years old, I dropped out of high school and so didn't have a whole lot of prospects and was looking through the job board at the time and, uh, the garden supply wholesale company locally was was hiring somebody for their soil plant. Um, so I was literally bagging potting soil and steer manure. That's what I did for a living. So I joke now that I've literally come from bagging shit to building, founding, running, and ultimately selling a multi-million dollar business. Um, but yeah, when I was in that garden supply company, 
I started in the soil plant. I was always a hardworking guy. So I knew, you know, that wasn't where I wanted to stay. I knew I was destined for greatness. I had bigger things ahead of me. So I worked hard. I worked my way up into the warehouse, picking orders, eventually got my class three or whatever it was, driver's license. So I started driving the truck and then eventually moved into sales. And that was where I kind of had my first introduction to what I talk about now. And that is the fact that we buy on emotion, or in fact, we make decisions based on emotion. And I realized that as, as I got into selling garden supplies, I realized that nobody buys a bag of steer manure because they want to own a bag of shit. Like that's not why we buy steer manure. We buy steer manure because ultimately we want the feeling that we're going to get when we can plant that garden, grow some beautiful flowers, grow some beautiful vegetables, whatever it is. Um, so ultimately we want the feeling that that product will eventually give us. And so that was kind of my first lesson into the impact that emotion has on human behavior. And eventually I went on, I sort of hit the ceiling at the garden supply company and I, I played hockey with a guy that was selling financial services and he was having lots of fun, making lots of money. I was 24 years old. So I said, you know, how, how do I do what you do? Looks like you're having a good time. And, and so he shared that with me and I uh, did all the things I needed to do to get there, did, did all the courses, got the licensing sorted out and jumped into that realm. And again, same thing. I realized that customers, when they give me their money from an investment standpoint, you know, they don't buy the investment right? They're buying that future dream, that feeling of security the investment will give them to move into their retirement, all those kinds of things. So, you know, I really worked hard to learn how to build that emotional connection with my customers. And I think it was, you know, I was 26 years old. Um, kind of my, my next big lesson was I, I walked into the Porsche dealership in, in downtown Vancouver, British Columbia. And there is nothing logical about a 26 year old buying a Porsche. So I walked into that, that dealership and the sales guy there, Bill, he knew that all too well. And he sat me down in that Porsche. The, the roof was down in the showroom. He stroked the leather and he said, Oh, doesn't that feel magnificent? He said, can you just imagine driving this thing up the sea to sky highway, which is the highway from Vancouver up to Whistler, which is a couple hour drive, but it's a windy road up the mountain along the ocean, like just a gorgeous drive. And, uh, you know, so he fully understood that we buy on emotion and he got me emotionally invested into that car. And he said, how'd you like to take this out for a test drive? And so we did. So I bought the Porsche. I mean, it was ridiculous at, at 26 years old. It was probably what I made in a year or, or more even like it, it, it was absolutely ridiculous. There's nothing logical about buying a Porsche at 26 years old, but I bought on emotion. So, you know, again, flash forward, eventually I moved to uh, the next province over. Wait, what um, happened to the Porsche? So did you well, I, yeah, well, that interesting story. So I eventually, I moved to the next province over to open up a branch office for that financial services company that I was working for. And I moved out here. It's where I live now. Um, but nobody else wanted to go. It's Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, not a super spectacular scenic place. It's extremely cold in the winter, like minus 30 Celsius cold. Vancouver is very temperate. You've got mountains, you've got oceans. Edmonton's got the West Edmonton Mall and the Edmonton Oilers. Like that's our claim to fame. So nobody wanted to move to Edmonton when it was time to open up the branch office, but I was young and dumb and hungry and I, I wanted to take on the world. And so I, I put up my hand and said, yeah, I'll go do it. I was, I think, 28 at that time. And uh, so I moved out to Edmonton and we moved. I brought my fiance out here at the time. She was away on a trip for seven weeks. She came home. I said, hey, how'd you like to move to Edmonton? So we moved to Edmonton on September 1st, 1997, October 3rd, 1997. I got the phone call from the regulator in BC. They, uh, they shut down the company that I was working for. It turns out it was the largest fraud in BC history, a $240 million Ponzi scheme. 
these guys were taken from investment A to pay for investment B and just working it around and around and around. And eventually it collapsed. The regulator caught up with them. So here I am. I'm a new face in a new town. Um, I've just lost, you know, probably 15 million bucks worth of my my personal investors capital. You know, some of my money that I'd earned over the, the course of the years, uh, a lot of friends and family. And, you know, it was just devastating. So the Porsche, to your question, um, I phoned up the dealership and it said, I think you better come take your Porsche back. So I actually loaded it up on a on a, a freight car and and sent it back to Vancouver to the dealership because I had it on a on a lease at at the time. So I ended up sending the Porsche back when when the things went sideways and I like I said I lost any money I had was gone. Most of most of my family and friends that invested gone. Like I think they they recovered maybe five cents on the dollar. So how did you react to that? I mean that's a lot of pressure, you know, at twenty years old saying that I lost everything. I lost my family and friend stuff. I, I messed up. Like, yeah, it, it, it was hard. I mean, there was an immense amount of shame that sort of surrounded that and just being able to sort of sit with that for me, it was about taking responsibility. Integrity has always been a big thing for me. How do I truly live my values of honesty, integrity? And so just, making sure that I was there to answer the phone calls as best I could. You know, I want to tell you, I answered every phone call, but truth is I probably dodged a few because there's just, there was no answers, right? I don't know. I don't know. And so there was a flurry of activity at the time where we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know if any of these real estate investment properties were actually legit. Could they liquidate some of these assets, get some of the money back? Um, so it was just, yeah, it was, it was devastating. And, and, you know, yeah, you're right. Like emotionally trying to deal with that burden for me, it, it became sort of a, almost a badge of honor. Like I had to carry that weight because I got everybody into this. So I had to do my best to get out of it. Did you have any breakdown? I mean, I, I could see some people drinking excessively, mm. you know, partying it up. I don't know, trying to just get it out of their head. Yeah, you know what? And that's that's a great question. I didn't. Um, I mean, again, I think in hindsight, I don't know that I was aware of how I was handling it at the time. But I really do believe that the research, the study I had done on sort of that emotional intelligence piece really allowed me to move through that better than I might have. And I don't know that at the time I sort of moved through it with that awareness. Like today, and as you said, you know, flash forward to 2015 and uh, my girlfriend gets murdered by an ex-boyfriend and I've got to navigate that. And at, at that time, you know, I was much more sort of conscious of the strategies that I used moving, moving through that. And that was, that was much more intentional. But, but again, in hindsight, I think you know, when the Aaron, Aaron mortgage was the name of the company, when, when that went belly up. Um, yeah. I mean, I think I moved through it because I didn't numb myself. I didn't turn to drugs or drinking or gambling or whatever. So how soon after that all kind of came crashing down before you started going, I need to find another way to survive. And so I looked for the jobs and stuff. Well, it, it, that was super interesting because what happened then was I immediately phoned. So I held the license for the company in, in the province of Alberta. So I immediately phoned the regulator here in Alberta and I said, Hey, look, this is what's happened. They've been, they pulled their plug in the, in the next province over. Um, so I'm terminating our license here. Cause obviously I can't be associated with these guys. Um, bad news. And again, at that time we didn't know how bad news it was. Uh, but these guys ended up going to jail. Like it was that bad news. Um, and so I'd said to the guys, I said, okay, so, but I'm going to stay here. I'm going to set up my own firm. Do you see any problems with that? And they said, well, no, as long as you're not implicated in any of the the deceit, the deception, then you should be okay. So I kind of, you know, I wound down the company 
here and then started my own. And when I went, <laughs> interesting story. So I went and did the licensing application and on the application, it says, you know, it's got all these questions. Have you ever been bankrupt? Have you ever been convicted of a criminal offense? Have you had, ever had your licensing revoked in any other jurisdiction? And I went down the list and I said, no, 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 no. Thinking that, well, my license hadn't been revoked in BC. It was the company's license. But of course, by extension, my license was revoked. So I had signed off on this and it was, you know, I swore an affidavit. So it was a legal document. So when I submitted that, the regulator came back to me and said, hey, you said, no, you've never had your license pulled. And I said, well, no, I didn't, as I told you, because like I phoned you and told you about this. So it's not like I was hiding anything. And they came back and said, no, nope, you swore a false affidavit. We have to do a whole investigation. And so it was just, it was like freaking nightmare. So I happened to rent uh, a condo from a guy that was a construction guy and and uh, at that time and your fiance is with you right my fiance was still with me yeah, yeah. and uh I, were, I i rented from a guy that was a construction guy and, and the market was just booming here at that time so i looked at him and i said do you need any help like I, i'm kind of useless when it comes to swinging a hammer but but i'm a hard worker so you know if you need me to move a wheelbarrow or something i can do that like in exchange for rent so uh, he said, yeah, absolutely. He was a concrete guy, a cribber. So we built and poured foundations for houses. And I remember being out there and it was December. And again, like I told you, in, in Edmonton, it, it's like minus 30 in the winter time. So it was a nasty time to be pouring basements in uh, Northern Alberta. But I remember sitting there and swinging a hammer and, and uh, you know, missing and hitting my thumb and going, ah, crap. And looking up and and there's this guy, Aaron, and he's leaning on his shovel and he's looking over and he's laughing at me and he's like, hey, broker, how's it going over there? And I'm just like, yeah, fuck you. <laughs> and that's when I realized that, yeah, that construction type stuff, like not my jam. I'm a, I'm much more of a, a white collar worker. The, that, the trade stuff just wasn't, I didn't have any aptitude for it, but, but I did it, right? Like I needed. It's hard to, work. I mean, I, like, I, I used to run job sites beyond like got, doing like QC work and stuff like that. And man, seeing these guys, man, the pressure they put on their, their legs out there, like, you know, laying concrete, it's just like, oh my gosh, I couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, it was tough, but you know what? I mean, it was a great lesson in that. Again, I tested that work ethic. I had the rug had been yanked out from under me, but I wasn't about to let that knock me down. You know, it's, it's that, whole life's going to hit you with stuff, but you just, you got to get back up again. And, uh, you know, I, I'd been knocked down pretty freaking hard at that point. So I think that was part of it too, was again, just making that conscious decision that fuck this shit, I'm not going to let this thing get me down. I, you know, again, my, my hope at that time was to get back into the finance world. But then when they were doing the investigation, it, it was going to take six months before they could either clear my name or tell me I was screwed. So, so how long did you last in the construction field? Maybe four months. Okay. So what, so yeah. what did you do next? You knew it wasn't right for you. Where'd you go next? Well, so, so that was, we waited for the investigation from the regulator to go through. They eventually came back and said, okay, we won't give you your own firm license but we'll let you have an individual license as long as you get licensed with a reputable company. So at that time I started shopping around looking at who was in the marketplace in Edmonton. And uh, at that time I went to, I ended up making the decision to go work for one of the local banks. Um, just new face, new town, get a brand name behind you and go for, go for it that way. So I, so I worked for one of the big banks here in Canada for five years um, before ultimately leaving. And I, and I was new at some point I'd get back to doing my own thing, but I had to establish myself um, here first. So, so I did that for five years and then ultimately I ended up founding uh, my own business. And again, at the beginning it was, it was me by myself. I eventually hired an admin assistant. Um, then I ended up having, I think six or seven, guys and gals from the bank that I used to work with. 
phone me up and say, hey, what are you doing over there? Looks like you're doing all right. And I said, yep, why don't you come over? So they left the bank and they came in and worked for me. And then, you know, again, flash forward 16 years later, um, you know, at our peak, I think we were probably top five in Canada. Uh, hmm. As far as firms go, we, we expanded nationally. Um, and like I said, uh, after, after Colleen was murdered, I kind of reassessed where I wanted to be, what I wanted to do. I spent the last four years now just, you know, I tried to dive back into it, but just my, my heart wasn't there. Um, so ultimately I sold uh, the business in December of 2019 uh, to focus more on, on the work that I do now. So um, can you walk us through uh, what happened with uh, the, the death of Colleen? Right, Colleen? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Like I said, I mean, we had, uh, yeah, it's again, life just throws you these curveballs, and, and uh, you're not prepared for them, but it was, it was October 2nd of 2015 and uh, she'd stayed overnight at my place. Um, she was a yoga instructor uh, an artist, a photographer, a videographer, and she was teaching yoga that Friday morning at 6 a.m. So she got up at my place at 5 o'clock, 5.30, came over my side of the bed to give me a kiss, say goodbye, and I said, uh, have fun at yoga. And off she went. I rolled over, went back to sleep, got up around 6, um, 6.30, got, went downstairs, got breakfast about 7 o'clock, 10 after 7. I shot her a text, as was her custom, and said, hey, how was yoga? And no response. And, uh, you know, which wasn't super out of character. She, uh, not a huge talker, but she's an incredible listener. And as a result, often got caught up in long drawn out conversations with some of her yoga students afterwards. And, and so I thought, yeah, not a big deal. And then, uh, you know, eight 30 rolls around, still nothing. I'm driving down to my appointment downtown at nine phone or no answer. Got a voicemail. I finished my appointment at 10, still nothing. Drive back to the office. I've got an 11 o'clock. And at this point, you know, you're, you're just starting to feel that in the pit of your stomach, like something's not right. Something's not right. And then uh, we wrapped up our 11 o'clock meeting. It was uh, it was, it was a, a recruiting meeting. Some guys that were going to come join the firm and we went across the street to, to lunch, to celebrate. And that's when I got the phone call. And as we walked into the restaurant, my phone rang and I looked at it and it was a blocked number and I answered it. And the voice on the other end of the line said, is this Mike Cameron? And I said, yeah, he said, this is constable so-and-so. And I don't remember his name and my heart just sank. And I immediately said, is she okay? And he says, where are you? I said, is she okay? And I started yelling at the phone. Is she okay? And he says, where are you? We're at your house. We're coming to you. So I told him where I was and I turned and I walked out of the restaurant and I, I don't think I even said two words to my guests. And I stood at the, the curb and I waited and about five, seven minutes later, an unmarked police car pulls up across the street and this two badass burly looking plainclothes cops get out. They got a gun on their hip and badge hanging around their neck, walk across the street and I walk towards them and meet them. And and that's when, you know, he just looked me in the eye and, and he, he said uh, three words that would change my life forever. He just looked at me and he said, Colleen is dead. And, and that was it. And I just, like, you kind of go into shock and this, like this fucking, this can't be real. This can't be real. That became my mantra in my head. And they took me into the car, into the back of the car. And of course, I had no idea what had happened. All that I knew was she was gone. And so they start grilling me with questions. When's the last time you saw her? Where'd you guys go last night? Did you see anything? Was anybody following you? Where did you go? What time did you go for dinner? When did you get back to your house? And I'm just like, what the fuck is going on? And, and I, you know, what about the kids? Are the kids okay? They wouldn't tell me anything. And my, my head was just spinning. And then I'm like, do you think I had something to do with this? And then I'm just like, holy shit. Well, of course they think I had something to do with this. Like, why wouldn't they? And again, I didn't know what had happened at the time. All I knew that was that she was gone and uh, they wouldn't tell me anything. So I'm, I'm sort of vacillating between trying to be cooperative and being pissed off because they just wouldn't tell me anything. And uh, eventually, 
one of the guys says, um, and then I put two and two together and I started asking questions like, was it him? Um, because I knew her ex had been giving her a little grief. Um, and uh, they wouldn't tell me anything again. And then finally, like I was freaking out, like, what about the kid? Like, are, should I be concerned for my kid? Should I be concerned for my safety? Like, is he still out there? Is he going to come after me? Like what's going on? And so one of the cops says something to the effect of, he says, well, let me put it this way. We're not actively looking for anybody in this investigation. And I just went like, I just about lost my mind. I went like, what the fuck are you talking about? And then he said, let me put it this way. If there were anybody to be looking for, we would be looking for them, but we're not actively, he said, even if they'd left the country, we would be looking for them, but we're not actively looking for anybody. And then I, then that's when I realized he killed himself. He took his own life. And, and that's exactly what had happened. And it was just, yeah, like, holy shit. Like this kind of stuff doesn't happen in real life. This is the kind of stuff that happens in movies. So, I mean, we talked before about this and, and you're telling me that you're still, even for the last couple of years, and even though that, that happened about I mean, five years ago, you still been kind of having thoughts about it and kind of working through it. Can you? Yeah. I, I mean, again, I, I think it's not something that you ever, you know, we talk about getting over things. Yeah. I don't know that it's, it's something we ever get over. I think it's something we get on with, you know, we carry it with us. It stays with us. And for me, you know, you asked before about the, the, when the, the financial collapse happened and, and how I sort of dealt with that versus, you know, diving into drugs or alcohol or, or, you know, whatever um, type of distraction you could. And it was the same thing here. And for, for me, one of the things that happened that really changed my life, I had a friend of mine uh, a yogi from Montreal, which is the other side of the country, who I'd, I'd actually only met physically once, but somebody had connected us just because we thought we, they thought we would get along well. And they were right. We just clicked. First time we talked on the phone, we just clicked. Anyways, he sent me, um, it's called a, a letter to Rachel by a fellow by the name of Ram Dass. And Ram Dass is an American spiritual leader. He wrote the book, Be Here Now, uh, back in the 70s, I think. Um, Ram Dass just recently passed away, but he wrote this, uh, what's called the letter to Rachel and Rachel was a young girl who was killed. Uh, and this letter to Rachel was actually a letter that he wrote to her parents and Eric, my friend shared this with me and this letter changed my life. It's short. It's worth reading. I've probably read it 250 times in the last four years. Um, but there were three big takeaways from that for me. The first thing he said in the letter is who among us is strong enough to remain conscious through such teachings as you are receiving? Probably very few. And when I read that, I knew that I had a decision to make that I could choose to remain conscious, process what was going on, observe whatever was coming up and learn from it. Or I could dive into a bottle or, you know, all those other possibilities. Who among us is strong enough to remain conscious through such teachings as you are receiving? Probably very few. So I made a very conscious decision to stay awake through this process. The second thing in the letter it talked about was our rational minds will never understand what has happened, but our hearts, if we keep them open, will find their own intuitive way. And again, I can't tell you how many times I just, I said, why, 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 why would this happen to her? Such a beautiful, wonderful person. Why, 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 why? And as you can imagine, I mean, there's no rational explanation for it. There's no logical explanation why one human being would do that to somebody else. So we've got to trust our hearts navigating through these things. And the last one, and maybe most important, was now is the time to let your grief find expression. No false strength. For Rachel's death was her legacy to you. And I just thought, how appropriate. You know, as guys, we're taught to be tough, to be strong, to put on this false bravado. 
to not grieve, to not cry. And I just decided at that time that that was not going to be the case for me. I was going to let my grief find expression. You know, if there were times where I needed to curl up into a little ball on the floor and ball my eyes out, I was going to do that. And I did. And there were times where I was driving down the highway and just this fucking rage would come over me and I'd beat my hands on the steering wheel. But I felt it. I felt it all. I didn't put on any bullshit false strength. And I think, you know, that's where we get in trouble. And especially as men, we put on this, this mask, this armor, and we bury these feelings, you know, and that was one of the other things. I had so many good friends surround me, pat me on the back and tell me to be strong. But I can tell you, Vinny, like, I didn't want to be strong. I wanted to fucking curl up into a little ball and I wanted to cry like a baby. So, you know, while I love them for their intention, it just, it makes me sad that our Western culture's version of strength is avoiding suppressing or burying those emotions. It, it, it's always going to find a way out. I mean, no matter how, how much you try to hide it, no matter how much you have a strong enough game plan, it's still going to be there. So, you, you mean, you have to find a way to let it out. Huh? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. You know, true strength is about having the courage to sit with those feelings, observe them, and then learn from them what we can. Because you're right. If we don't control how they come, they're going to come, you know, whether it's, it's illness, addiction, insomnia, you know, you name it, it's, it's coming out one way, shape or form. So you're better off to find a way to control that outlet. What's so, I mean, this is a kind of a spin on it. Cause we've already kind of talked about like a lot of the hurdles you kind of come through. And this is kind of usually the part where I, I bring up the idea of you could talk to your younger self. I think something I means changing this kind of thing is if you could talk to someone that maybe lost a loved one, you know, and is dealing with that currently right now, what kind of advice do you think you'd give to that person? Yeah, well, in fact, if anybody's interested, if they go to my website, mikecameron.ca, I actually have a letter I wrote to a friend of mine who lost his girlfriend to suicide um, fairly shortly after what happened to Colleen. So he had phoned me. Um, he knew, like, I was one of the few people that would actually understand what he was going through and so i wrote him a letter and i ended up publishing it uh, publicly but yeah i think you know the the big thing is that allow your grief to come out it's okay understand that everybody's going to grieve a little bit differently you know how you process things is going to be different than how i process things so you know, find your, follow your heart, let your heart find that intuitive way. You don't have to do it any particular way. And it's not linear. It's not, you know, aren't you over that yet? No, because sometimes, you know, you'll have good days and then maybe you go back two steps and you'll have bad days and you'll have challenges. But learning to embrace those days where you're feeling less than stellar and just sitting with that emotion and feeling it and learning to sit with that with curiosity and wonder and just observe that feeling, that sadness. You know, I used to talk about how I would sometimes listen to, you know, a particular song that would, that would make me think of her. And of course, you know, that would make me sad. And, you know, I had people ask me, like, why do you do that? Like, why, why do you intentionally make yourself sad? And it became, for me, it was, it was like, there's this odd comfort in being able to have those feelings. It's like having coffee with an old friend, you know, just being able to sit with that sadness. Um, I talk about it like that. It's that happy sadness. You know, there's a sadness, but there's a comfort to it when you can just sit with it. So one of the other things is surround yourself with people that get it. Surround yourself with people that get it and forgive the ones that don't, because there's going to be lots that don't, and it can be very frustrating at times. So, you know, I know I've talked to others that, that have gone through some major tragedy that get very angry with people around them that just don't get it. And they want it to, they want them to suck it up and get over it. Like, aren't you over it yet? That was five years ago. 
And you know what, unless you've been there, it's about having empathy for those that don't get it. And that's okay. So forgive the ones that don't get it. Surround yourself with the ones that do. And understand that your journey is going to be your journey. And that's okay. And not beating yourself up about how you're doing it. You know, obviously, you want to be careful not to, like I said, dive into a bottle or or drugs or whatever. Um, and, and I think when that comes, that's that's a symptom, not the cause, right? The cause is these feelings are painful, so we want to avoid them. So how do we avoid them? We drink a lot to avoid them. We do drugs to avoid them. We gamble to avoid them. We throw ourselves into our work to avoid them. We become workaholics. You know, there's all these sort of emotional numbing techniques that we employ. So, you know, again, just be aware if you find yourself starting to employ some of these emotional numbing techniques, be aware of that and recognize that, yeah, you know what? There might be times where it's just overwhelming and you need to retreat. You need to back off and that's okay. So what, but just, what's next for, for Mike Cameron? What's we're talking a year from now, two years from now, what do you think, what does what your future hold do? Well, I, again, my mission is to, to literally teach men that it's okay to feel shit. Like, I, I think, you know, this is part of the challenge that we have and we're, we're hearing more conversation about it now, but I'm not sure we're quite getting to the root of it. And when, as a man, when I can really step into my heart and how I feel and be okay with that, and be okay to express that and process that, life gets so much richer, so much more colorful. You know, I talk about, for me, it's the difference between living in black and white and living in full technicolor. You know, when I go to a concert now, for example, the experience is just so much richer because I can feel it. It's not, I'm not just there observing it. I'm experiencing it. And that comes for me, at least from practicing feeling like literally practicing feeling. I mean, I think it's, it's pretty widely accepted that as dudes, if we want to get physically fit and strong, you know, I run ultra marathons. If, if I want to run a hundred miles, I know I got to go to the gym a few times a week. I got to get out on the track a few times a week. Yet when it comes to our emotional fitness, what do we do? And the answer for most of us is nothing, jack shit. We don't do anything with our emotional hygiene, our emotional fitness. So I use the acronym SOAR. So I founded an organization called Connected Men, which really just creates safe spa spaces for men to practice feeling. And we use the, the framework SOAR, slow down, open up, accept, and reconnect with your emotional self. And so a big part of it, you know, if, if you guys were to take away anything from this, it's just practice the pause, slowing down. So it's that awareness piece. Thank you, Mike, you know, um, yeah, for, for all the information you provided. Hopefully people listening right now, if you're going through a, a tough time, I mean, allow yourself to let the emotions out, be okay with crying. I mean, like I talked, we talked about it, me and you, I was going through some tough stuff um before and i was pretty adamant about that everything was good and the next thing i know i'm sitting with some loved ones and i just start bawling i was like what's going on what is this watery substance coming out of my eyes and so it's just one of those things that but it felt it felt so good after after that happened and so anyone out there if you're going through a difficult time allow yourself uh to let the emotions out yeah absolutely absolutely all right thanks everyone please subscribe please share um follow mike we're gonna have his information in the description uh, and yeah, please, we love your feedback. Thank you for listening to The Road to Growth, Success of an Entrepreneur. Please like, subscribe, and stay connected. Visit www.TheEnriquezGroup.com. Yeah, I created a website. Hope to see you again next week. The Enriquez Group, signing off.